Concerns around gas stoves keep popping up in the news, so we thought it would be a good, good topic to delve into. To start the evening, we'll stream a five minute video, which asks the question, how bad are gas stoves? Following this, we will have presentations by two speakers and another short video on induction stoves. If you have any questions at all during the evening, just type them into the chat and we'll be having a little Q&A a bit later on. So Lori, if you could go ahead now and play the video um, with Michael Thomas, how bad are our gas stoves? Recently, there's been a lot of news about gas stoves. Federal officials may be considering a ban on gas stoves. In an interview with Bloomberg, a commissioner with a government agency called gas stoves a hidden hazard. And to be honest, I was initially a little skeptical about the panic over gas cooking. So I read through dozens of studies, interviewed a few experts, and put indoor air quality monitors throughout my home. And what I discovered was pretty alarming. So for the second one, uh, uh, the monthly one, is, is that your daily average? Yeah, that is. Oh boy. Before getting into the data, it's helpful to understand what makes gas stoves so bad for our health in the first place. Cooking on any stove produces a range of indoor air pollutants, but gas stoves are unique in that they produce nitrogen dioxide, or NO2. At high enough levels, NO2 exposure can cause respiratory illnesses like asthma. So for two months, I monitored the NO2 levels in our home as we cooked. Every time I turned on our stove or oven, I'd watch our NO2 pollution spike. Now, I'm not an expert on indoor air pollution, so I reached out to Josiah Keppert, who studies this stuff for a living at Drexel University. Josiah has run thousands of tests on indoor air quality, so I asked him for some help making sense of my data. He told me that there's two important metrics to watch. The first one is hourly NO2 concentration levels. The WHO hourly guideline is around 106 parts per billion. But what you can see here is around 650, this enormous spike. Um, up to almost 300, um, about three times the hourly guideline. As bad as my hourly data looked, Josiah told me that in many of the other studies he's run, he's seen these NO2 levels stay high for hours. When I've done measurements in my own home or in other people's homes, you would see this huge spike go up and then it stays that high or even goes higher and higher over time. The second set of data that we looked at was my daily average NO2 levels over the course of a month. So this chart is it's pretty alarming. Um, the WHO last year, they reduced their annual guideline from around 21 parts per billion to around five parts per billion. So that's a 75% reduction in this annual guideline. And so you can see here that, I mean, almost every single day here is about 10 times higher than the WHO guideline. Now, at this point, I know what you might be thinking. This is just one data point but dozens of studies have shown that homes with gas stoves have consistently high levels of NO2, and that creates a lot of health risks. In 2013, researchers analyzed data from tens of thousands of homes, and they found that children living in a home with a gas stove have a 42% higher chance of developing asthma. Just a few months ago, researchers found that 12.7% of childhood asthma cases can be attributed to a gas stove. I recently interviewed Brady Seals, one of the authors of that paper, and she told me this. When we look at other population attributable fractions, that's really similar to children's risk of, of asthma from exposure to secondhand smoke. So I think most of us know that secondhand smoke exposure is not great, but how many of us know that gas cooking could have a similar risk? All of this is getting a little heavy, so I want to take a break to hear from one of our sponsors, the natural gas industry. Cooking with gas. gas. Cooking with gas. gas. We all cook better when we're cooking with gas. gas. Gas is so hot, it's not on when it's off. It's the only way to cook. That's what I was taught. All right, thanks, gas industry. Now, back to some of the research. So, according to climate scientists, gas stoves aren't just bad for our health. They're also warming up our planet. Natural gas is a fossil fuel, and when it's burned, carbon dioxide is released into the atmosphere. But natural gas is mostly methane, which is an especially potent greenhouse gas. Once it gets into the atmosphere, methane warms the planet about 25 to 80 times faster than carbon dioxide. Recently, a group of researchers at Stanford looked at how much methane was leaking from people's stoves. They found that even when stoves are off, they leak this super pollutant. And that methane is heating up the planet as much as the pollution from 600,000 gas-powered cars. For all these reasons, the experts that I spoke to for this video think that we should eventually phase out gas stoves. 
A few cities and states have already passed laws that would help do this. Today, the city council voted to ban natural gas from all new construction and require electrical instead. New York City, California, and Washington have all passed policies that would prevent builders from putting gas stoves in new homes. When some people hear about these laws, they think the only alternative to gas cooking is the electric coil stoves in their grandma's house. But electric stove technology has come a long way in recent years. Induction stoves, for example, use advanced technology to offer a super precise and efficient cooking experience. Many chefs like John Kung and Eric Repair actually prefer induction for this reason. As I mentioned, I was a bit skeptical of the panic over gas cooking when I began this research. Like many people, I liked cooking on gas. But then I ran my experiment and talked to experts like Josiah and Brady. And it became clear, gas stoves are bad for both our health and the planet. Thank you, Lori. Um, I will introduce our first speaker tonight now. Dr. Kadi Henry is a recently retired family physician who practiced in the US and in Summerland. She is the co-chair for First Things First Okanagan and a member of the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment. Kadi will review some of the evidence for health concerns that come from using methane gas in the home. So Kadi, you can please go ahead now. And I'm unmuted. Thank you, Sue. That's great. Um, so that was a great presentation. Uh, the video really ran through, I think, the most important points. Um, I'm going to try to uh, emphasize some of those and maybe just go through them a little bit slower. Um, but we'll be talking about the role that methane plays in climate change and how it affects the health in the home. So if we could go ahead and put the slides up, Lori, that would be great. Ooh. Hmm. Well, that's interesting. <laughs> can you see it? I, I can. It just looks like there's some black um, pieces in front of some of the text, but isn't it, can everyone else see it okay? No, there is some black. Uh, Lori, I'm not sure what, if, if you have anything on your screen that you can move aside, perhaps? There, it's help. It's, yep, gradually. But if you have any more content blocks, maybe you can just hide them. Uh, no. There, there's, yeah, I'm it's all, all gone except a, a couple of lines on the top. Yep, you're moving them now. I can't get rid of that. That's my control panel for the. Okay. I think that won't be a problem for the rest of the slides. So we'll just go ahead and um, have the, the, the X over the eyes there. Um, <laughs> Okay. In any case, um, yeah. So I'm. Uh, uh, we mentioned the ca the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment. Um, I I'm a member of that. Uh, it was founded in 1993, so that's 30 years ago now. Um, to address how the environment impacts our health and whether that's from pollution or climate change, and oftentimes it's both. So we're going to use some of their material tonight. They do quite a bit of policy work. If you're interested in some of the other things they're involved in, um, I would recommend their website. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, perfect. Um, so just for a little bit of context, in British Columbia, almost all of the gas that we use for heating and cooking, which we refer to sometimes as natural gas, um, comes from fracking. And it's important to know that fracking itself is a very unhealthy process. So it devastates the environment. It wastes and pollutes large amounts of water, creates pools of toxic waste, and exposes the farmers and the families who live in the area to a higher risk of unhealthy pregnancies, cancer, and lung disease. So uh, getting the gas is not healthy, and the so-called natural gas is actually over 90% methane. So I'm going to use the word methane when we're talking about gas use. Uh, now methane, as they said in the video, is a fossil fuel, and like all fossil fuels, it does add carbon dioxide or CO2 to the atmosphere when it's burned. And uh, while the carbon dioxide is the main component of greenhouse gases that cause climate change, the unburned methane that escapes is also a greenhouse gas. Um, and as though, although it doesn't last quite as long as uh, CO2, it is over 80% times more potent over the first 20 years and at least 25 times as much over the 100 years. So 
This unburned methane does add significantly to climate change when it leaks from wells, pipelines, or appliances, which it regularly does, unfortunately. Um, the IPC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, has raised the alarm that the planet will be uninhabitable if we don't curb the use of all fossil fuels, and that does include methane. So we have our work cut out for us if we are going to meet our climate tar targets. Um, next slide, please. So how much of a problem is the methane in our houses? Uh, we use it for a number of things, for furnaces, water heaters, clothes dryers, fireplaces, cooking appliances, and uh, more, are being, more houses are being hooked up each year still. Um, so it's a growing problem. And in British Columbia, each year, the overall effect on the climate from the gases that get emitted from homes that are hooked up to methane um, is estimated to be about the same as more than 870,000 vehicles, which is a lot. Um, and in Penticton, we have a climate action plan um, and it's determined that the buildings that are connected to methane account for about 32% of the fossil fuel emissions for the entire city. And just heating one typical single family home in BC entirely with methane can emit <clears throat> 4.9 tons of carbon dioxide equivalent in a year. So it, it's a lot. Uh, next slide, please. So apart from the effect on the climate, uh, people have been concerned for many years that burning methane creates chemicals that can damage your health. And um, as I mentioned in the video, the nitrogen dioxide is one of the main culprits, um, but it also creates other nitric oxides, carbon monoxide, formaldehyde, and particulate matter. So uh, it's not just one thing that gets produced when you burn it. And they have done lots of studies going back as far as 50 years to see uh, what the effect is and found that it is linked to lung disease with the strongest effect on childhood asthma. So uh, this is important because people are particularly affected by the methane that comes from our stoves because you have an open flame that's in a usually a closed kitchen where a lot of people are gathering nearby, whereas a furnace might be hidden away uh, somewhere and you're not right next to the flame. Uh, but it has a huge, the, the stoves have a huge effect um, on the, on the emissions that are in your house. So uh, they found uh, in some of the studies that have been done recently that more than 12% of current childhood asthma cases in the US can be attributed to methane gas stove use, um, just as they had mentioned in the video that preceded this. So uh, the next couple of slides, Laurie, if you just wanna show them quickly, um, I put just a couple of slides that list some of the studies that have been done that document the health effects of nitrogen dioxide and some of the other byproducts that are you get from using methane. Just so that people don't think this is like one study, uh, this has been going on for a long time. It's well reached, well researched, and well documented. Uh, number uh, next slide, please, Lori. And because of all these studies that have been done. Um, there have been international guidelines that have been put forth, both by the World Health Organization and by Health Canada, um, and both have, orga have actually reduced the recommended amounts that uh, people be exposed to as the studies have come rolling in and they've seen that they are increasingly uh, dangerous to health. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. Uh, Stanford study, yes. So the study that, that really got people's attention um, was one that came out of Stanford in 2022 that they just briefly touched on in the video. But in this study, they didn't just look at the level of the pollutants that were caused by the methane stoves uh, of various brands and ages, which they did do. They also decided to look at what happened when the stoves were turned on and off, left on for cooking, and when they were not even being used at all. And it may not be surprising, but they found that larger stoves produced more of the asthma causing um, nitri di um, nitrogen dioxide and other pollutants. And they noted that if people didn't have proper stove ventilation within just a few minutes of cooking, they could easily exceed the Environmental Protection Agency limits that are out there for a full hour of exposure to nitrogen dioxide. And I think there was a very um, compelling graphic in the video that showed how high some of these levels of pollutants were in the, in the uh, person's home who was doing the video. The other thing they saw was that there was a little puff of methane gas that gets admitted, uh, get, get, gets emitted when you turn the stove on 
and off. And just that little puff of gas that comes out that's not burned, it's just like uh, the gas that's going into the environment, was about the same as you would release, because there's always some that leaks a little bit, during a full 10 minutes of cooking. And the stoves that had pilot lights were the worst. And they weren't. They didn't realize that this was such a, a, a spike that happened just when you turned them on and off. But even more surprising, they found that more than three quarters of the methane was re, um, of the methane that was released uh, in this in the house came when the stoves were completely turned off. So the stoves were leaking methane, likely through gas fittings and connections, even if you never used the stove. Um, and this was really big news, uh, obviously not good for the climate because um, all of that unburned methane is such a potent greenhouse gas. So between the uh, known health effects uh, from the from burning the methane and the climate effects, of course, from the methane it isn't burned and leaks out, there have been a number of municipalities, including some of the larger ones in the U.S., that have decided to not allow methane gas in new builds. Uh, next slide, please. <laughs> Excuse me. So if you do have a stove that runs on methane, the most important thing that you should do is to make sure you have good ventilation and to keep the filters clean. But studies have shown that people only do this maybe 25 to 40 percent of the time if they even have a good uh, ventilation hood. <clears throat> but if you use the back burners, you can also uh, reduce the exposure to nitrogen dioxide um, a bit. Unfortunately, there really is no way to prevent the stove from leaking methane and adding to the greenhouse gas problem <clears throat> since it leaks even when it's turned off. But fortunately, there are safer and greener alternatives in electric and induction stoves, and the heat pumps are excellent options for heating the house. Next slide, please. <laughs> Excuse me. So um, currently, in British Columbia, uh, there are around a million households that are hooked up to methane, and unfortunately, the number is still increasing. But you can have um, federal, provincial, and municipal policy changes and regulations that will limit the growth, especially in new builds. And you can also have these entities uh, subsidize retrofits and help people obtain cleaner solutions for heating and cooking. So there are things that we can do. Um, and the next slide, please, Laurie. So in, in summary, there is excellent evidence that burning methane in stoves creates pollutants like nitrogen dioxide that increase asthma in children. That is abundantly clear. It's also very well established that the unburned methane is a dangerous greenhouse gas that leaks into the air from stoves and pipelines and makes climate change worse. There are safer and greener alternatives that we can consider. And uh, in the words of the president of uh, CAPE, the uh, Physici Physicians for the Environment, uh, Melissa Lem, she said, one in eight cases of pediatric asthma in the US has been linked to indoor air pollution from gas stoves. If that isn't motivation for us to get gas out of buildings and homes in BC and across Canada, I don't know what is. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kathy. There's a lot of information there. And again, I encourage people, if you have questions, to type, please type them into the chat and we'll have a q and a in a in a few minutes. The second video we'd like to show is called Why I Cook with Induction. It's a three minute long video and it features John Kung, who was in the previous video. Um, he's a Detroit based chef who became a TikTok sensation during COVID with his cooking videos. And hopefully you've all had dinner, so this doesn't make you too hungry. So you can go ahead, Lori, and start the video. When I started posting my cooking videos, one of the questions I wasn't really expecting to get was about the use of my electric burners. I ended up getting quite a few inquiries about them, both on Instagram and TikTok. And what I learned is that induction burners are not as common as I thought. So when I got asked to do a video about a kitchen technology that I had been using for years, I gladly obliged. Because it wasn't just a great way to cook, it was also good for your health and the environment. A few years ago, if you asked me which was my favorite heat source to work with, I would have said gas. Probably 90% of the cooks out there will say the same. Electric coils and glass tops are nightmares to deal with at any level of cooking. 
That changed when I learned about induction burners. I started with just one plug-in cooktop. I had it for years and I used it frequently when I did my pop-ups. It was great because in pop-up situations there isn't always a vent and I could get away with using this where portable gas burners were not allowed. As I got used to it, I started using it more and more, expanding my collection to the point where they are now pretty much all I use. Oh cool, I'm cooking with magnets, I thought. And that excited the techie in me, but as I used it more, I realized there were a lot of benefits to having this as a regular part of my kitchen arsenal. Basically, the trick with induction is that there is a magnetic field working so that the pan is heating itself from within. If you think about it that way, it becomes easier to understand. With any other burner, in some way, you're waiting for that source of heat, whether it be a coil or a glass top or a flame, to push that heat through the pan. With induction, depending on how you're using it, it's pretty much immediate. It's not really making any kind of sacrifices versus an open flame as much as it's just an adjustment in timing. There's less time you have to react, and that takes some getting used to, but over time you'll be just as efficient with it as you would a gas flame. Besides energy savings, there are other benefits to induction for your home. As a cook who worked in multiple kitchens, and as someone who ran his own space, I value the comfort of my crew, and working all day in a hot kitchen is exhausting. The fact that induction produces very little waste heat was my main reason for making the switch. My small kitchen was much cooler and the lack of fumes meant that I wouldn't have to spend money on high-powered ventilation. I'd later learned that the harmful fumes from gas burners is a massive source of indoor air pollution. It only reinforced my thinking to make the full switch for my home. Other benefits include the fact that they're safer for families since they don't have any exposed flames, and they're way easier to clean, which to me is a huge selling point. As this technology becomes more accessible, I do think those of us with access to it have the responsibility to adopt this from a climate standpoint. Fossil gas is now the largest source of climate pollution in the United States. Numerous studies show that moving to clean electric appliances for heating and cooking is the most cost-effective and lowest risk solution to cutting climate pollution from buildings, which account for 29% of U.S. emissions and 40% of emissions globally. Not everyone has the privilege of doing this, I know, but as someone who does, I see it as a personal responsibility. Honestly, it wasn't much of a sacrifice. It's only made my life easier in the long run. Thanks, Lori. Our second speaker tonight is Lori Goldman who is our Zoom expert and also a member of the F First Things First <laughs> Okanagan okay. Board. It's been in the news oh, a lot sorry. lately. Oh. <laughs> Lori is going to share her experience with using a countertop induction burner. So just go ahead, Lori. Oh, thank you, everyone. Uh, tonight's a little bit of a busy night for me. Uh, doing a lot of videos and uh, presenting. And so thank you for bearing with us. Um, I, uh, I think we learned a lot from that last video about induction cooking. And I just wanted to um, talk about my experience. Um, I picked up a double burner indu induction cooktop in October before our Clean Energy Expo. Uh, because I was staying at a friend's house with a gas range and I was thinking it really wasn't all that um, safe for me. And I also wanted to give it a try. And uh, since I got it, I have been using it on sitting on top of my electric range. I've been using it uh, since October and haven't turned my stove on except when I had friends over and we had a, a dinner party. Uh, the two, rain, two burners are good enough for me as a single person. Um, and um, I think that we can see that um, it doesn't work for everyone, uh, especially if you want to cook on a wok. You saw in that last video that that uh, chef had a, a burner that is kind of uh, concave, and so the wok could fit in because the burners are only a, a different sizes, and they only heat up the part of your pot that is sitting right on that burner. So if you move, if you have a, a pan that's larger, the outer edges and the sides don't get any heat. Um, but it's been working really well. And I really like it because it's fast to heat up. It's fast to cool down. Right after I turn it off, I'm able to wipe it off. I haven't had any problem keeping it clean. It doesn't heat up my kitchen. 
and 95% of the energy is going right into the food instead of going out into the room. Um, there are lots of options for these kinds of um, uh, ranges. My idea was to get a single or a double burner just to get started. And a lot of people start that way. They buy a small unit before they invest in a, in a range with an oven. Um, and uh, you can get a one burner for $60. My two burner was on sale at Canadian Tire for about $150. Now they're about $220, I think. Um, and then you can go to four burner cooktops or a range with an oven. And right now at, uh, I think I was in Home Hardware, they had a Frigidaire freestanding 30 inch with an air fryer oven for $1,500. And I'm not sure about the quality, but that's a pretty good starting point. One of the things is your uh, pans have to be magnetic um, uh, ability. So when I bought my pan, uh, sorry, my uh, cooktop, it came with a little magnet that I can walk around when I go shopping and attach it to the bottom of the pot and see if it is magnetic and usable on my um, induction range. Um, of course, now my anodized aluminum, my professional cookware, and my carbon uh, copper pans are now just uh, decorations in my house. Um, I don't know if you noticed at the end of that video, the chef had a little um, um, metal piece underneath his glass coffee maker. And that's a kind of a diffuser. So some people buy those, but they're about $100 and they're only good for um, uh, low heat. You wouldn't use that for high heat on your induction um, burner because it could damage the surface. Um, I have not invested in one of those. But I did find that um, it wasn't very expensive for me to go around and get the uh, um, pans that I needed at secondhand stores. I got Langostina three pots and a lid, and also a kind of a, a wok um, type of a stir fry pan, kind of a paella pan for under $50. And they're like brand new. Uh, so some people do invest in more, but all of my fry pans worked. My cast iron worked, my other fry pans that have a very uh, uh, thick base, they work just fine on the uh, induction range as well. Um, one thing I did notice is there's a small fan. When I turn it on, there's a noise of a fan and it runs a little bit after I turn it off. And that's a little bit um, bothersome. I've gotten used to it though. You also have to start cooking uh, with the pan on and something in the pan and at a low heat. If you have it too high, it, your pan can actually warp because they are really hot. So I found that I cook much lower. There are um, eight, I think, selections on my both burners. And I usually cook at about uh, two or three. Uh, I start water kind of high and then I put it back down to two because you don't need that much heat. Um, I have not left the kitchen for a long time because when I have my pots on the range, uh, I have burned a couple because they do get really hot. Um, the other thing is that uh, cast iron could and some other grit on the surface could scratch the surface even though it's very uh, scratch resistant. So you pick your pots up and put them down instead of moving them around. Also on my range, I can't have the pots touch each other. That messes up magnetic uh, power. So you have to make sure there's space between them. Some people talk about putting a, a parchment paper or a cloth underneath the pot when you're cooking so you don't have to do very much cleanup. But again, if you have it on high heat, you can scorch the uh, pan. Uh, oh, sorry, scorch the, the um, barrier uh, or damage your surface. So most research says to not use anything underneath your pot. Um, the other thing is that there is a risk with people who have pacemakers, the magnetic uh, power might interfere with the device. And so if s someone has a pacemaker, they have to actually talk to their doctor. 
because you have to be a certain distance from it before using it. So probably it wouldn't work for somebody with a pacemaker. Even with all of these sort of difficulties, like not being able to use your walk and other things, I think that um, using induction makes a lot of sense. And it certainly has for me. I've adjusted to only cooking on two burners. I have a toaster oven to do other baking and I have an instant pot. I'm producing less heat in my kitchen and I'm using way less power and it's been a journey, uh, but it's been really fun to experiment with it. And I'm really happy that I made that kind of a, uh, a change. And I encourage everybody to look into doing induction. Thanks. Um, maybe people could talk about uh, whether they have uh, used induction. Uh, I noticed that we, sorry about that. I, I noticed that we only have one question from the audience so far. So maybe we can just, and we're a small enough group, we can leave it in the gallery setting. Well, here's someone that has an induction stove top that's and they love it so any oh. point that you want to add yeah to julia you want to share something <laughs> um sure uh yeah we got our induction stove when we um uh, did a renovation in our kitchen um and uh we had a uh, our neighbor actually give us a demonstration of how quickly you could boil a pot of water and how efficient they are. They're incredibly efficient. Um, and you're right, they don't heat up the kitchen. And um, I don't have the same problem with burning things. Um, I, I find that um, you just have to keep an eye on it, yes. Uh, but after a while, you know, that just becomes kind of second nature. And it, but it's it's very adjustable, and if you you can turn it down, and immediately the heat goes down in in what's ever in the pot. So we find it um, just uh, an incredibly efficient way to uh, cook food. It's even better than the microwave and heating things up. Actually, like if you got you know chili that you want to heat up, um, just throw it in a, a saucepan, and it just takes a couple of minutes. It's it is faster than the microwave. So we love it. <laughs>